uh, just right now, Git is the mostly used versioning system in our job. But do you know all of its power? Well known for her skills in, on this field, Pauline Voss is software engineer. She comes from Amsterdam and wants to share with you some tricks that helped her out more than once. Ladies and gentlemen, Pauline Voss. Hello. Uh, sorry, I'm going to take the mask off because I know that with the masks for me, understanding French is super <laughs> difficult because I can't see your mouth, so I assume it's the same vice versa. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone for, for coming to the Grace Hopper room. Um, I, uh, I saw the talk description for the, for the other track and it was actually really interesting. So I, I didn't realize we were going to be this full, but thank you all for coming. Uh, this is my first physical conference talk since uh, the pandemic started. So uh, yeah, super excited. Um, yeah, it's really nice to be to be back and to see everyone. I'm sure you all feel the same. So um, yeah, we're gonna learn some advanced Git magic today. So uh, just to tell you a little bit about me, well, I guess we already had a bit of an introduction, but this is me, of course. I'm Pauline, I'm a software engineer from Amsterdam. I work for the Instapro group, which is a conglomerate of different home services, websites. The French one is travaux.com. I don't know if that's, I think that's a fairly big one. I hope my pronunciation was good as well. <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm a speaker at conferences. I also give workshops and trainings, and it's mostly about Git. Um, that's my Twitter handle, and I also want to invite you. I don't know how much time we're going to have left for questions afterwards, so please feel free. DMs are always open. Please feel free to hit me up on Twitter with any questions that you might have. And I'm also June's mom since 16, month, 16 months ago. This is June. She's very cute, as you can see. And I, this, is, this is my first real trip without her, so I, I miss her very much. So let's get to it. I've called this talk Advanced Git Magic, but actually I think I should have called it Git Legit 2. Back to the feature. Because what we're going to do today is we're going to look at a bit of time traveling, traveling back and forth in your, your history and different, what, like, um, different um, types of history. Um, and it's kind of a sequel to my first talk about Git, which was Git Legit. It's a stretch, but has anyone seen that by any chance? Maybe recording? See so a few hands, not that many. So um, how many of you have heard about Atomic Commits? OK, a few more hands. That's good, because basically Git Legit um, explains atomic commits as a foundation for really good Git hygiene, basically, and making your life a little bit easier as a developer if you, if you implement them. Um, so if you've missed it, we're going to do a little bit of a recap, but it kind of this talk kind of assumes a little bit that you do know what those things are. Um, so there are some things you can follow along with. We don't have that much time, so I'm not going to really, really wait for everyone to catch up. But if you do want to follow along, um, you can already already clone this repo uh, for at the end of the talk. And then you can you can follow along with that if you want. I'll give you a second. It's just my name at GitHub. You can also go to github.com, go to my GitHub account. And uh, you'll find it there. The repo is called Bisect Regression Testing. All you need for it is Git and uh, PHP 7.4 or up. OK. So uh, a bit of a recap about atomic commits. So atomic commits are what basically I base everything on. Um, so atomic commits are kind of a best practice when it comes to committing. Uh, they're not different types of commits. You don't need different type of uh, different type of tooling or special type of tooling to create uh, atomic commits. They're just a way of organizing your commits essentially. So atomic commits are really small, and uh, they have basically three features. Uh, they're a single ir uh, irreducible unit, so you can't break them apart. They're that small, and they pertain to only one fix or feature or whatever you do. You're not going to use one commit for, uh, you know, refactoring and fixing a bug and uh, adding a feature. Um, everything works, especially the build itself. Uh, it's important that it's stable. We'll see why, especially um, later, uh, because it it will help you with a bunch of things. Um, I don't know why I put a 
red thing around it, but I guess <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and the third feature is uh, all the commit messages are clear and concise. So with one glance at the commit message, you can see what the purpose is um, from uh, of the commit message and of the changes. You know what's changed and you know why it's changed. Uh, and that becomes a lot easier when you keep to the first one, uh, when you keep every commit pertaining to one thing. Um, you can uh, keep your commits atomic by interactively rebasing. So if you want to keep your uh, commits atomic, it means you have to rewrite history sometimes because you're, you're committing over time, right? You're, you're basically saving uh, the state of your work. But actually, if you use atomic commits, you want to make sure that every change is added to the commit that it belongs to. So if I'm creating, if I'm fixing a bug, for instance, I don't want to then have that bug fix spread out over three commits. I want to keep adding to that original um, uh, commit that fixed the bug. Uh, and that's how you do it. You can do that by amending your commits. That's a way of rewriting your history in Git, or by interactively rebasing. Interactive rebase is kind of the same as a uh, regular rebase, except it gives you a little bit more control over how you rebase. So you can, if you rebase over your own branch like this interactively, um, you see a list of the commits that you want to rebase on, and you can replace that pick part by any of the commands under there. So you can kind of uh, edit your commits and, and still add changes to it after you've made the commit. So you're kind of rewriting history. That's the, that's the thing, basically. And the way you rebase over your own branch is like this. So interactive rebase, head, tilde, and then the amount of commits you want to go back. So we'll have a look at how that looks. So here I have some unstaged changes. We're going to stash them. Then I'm going to go into my interactive rebase, and I'm going to go five commits back. You'll see the commits here. And I'm going to replace this pick with an E for edit, which will make it check that commit out. So now it's checking that commit out. I can apply my stash to it, or pop, whichever you prefer, and just add those changes, stage them. And when I continue with the rebase, uh, I can change the commit message if I want. But then those staged changes were added to this commit. So this commit that's in the past. And then it does that for every commit that you said you wanted to do something with. So either edit or reword or whatever. And then when you're fi you finish your rebase, you've cleaned up and rewritten your history, basically. So that is how you can keep your commits atomic. So that's a really, really summarized recap um, of a lot of the stuff I talk about in Git Legit. Does that, was that too fast or does that make sense? I see some. Quite a lot of nods and some thumbs up. Okay, great. Okay, so I said that this talk is very much also about time travel. So that's what we're going to do. Of course, Git is a, well, it's a version control system, but it, it's a history of what you've done, right? Um, I guess that that's what version, version control is. You can look in, in the past and, and see what's, what's changed and, and what happened. Um, so we're going to look at different ways of time traveling. And if you want, you can already follow along. You can do this with any repo that you have. So if you have your, if you happen, I don't see a lot of laptops actually, but if you do happen to have your laptop with you in this talk, you can go to any repository you have, go into the terminal and just follow along. I don't actually think I see any laptops. Wow. Oh, hey, one laptop. <laughs> so you, sir. <laughs> are screwed because you're going to be picked for crowd participation. No, it's, it's not that intense. But OK, if you want to follow along, uh, please do. Um, but one way to travel back in time uh, is like this. So you use git checkout as if you were checking out a branch. But you can also check out a point in the past. So in this case, I think you see, you've seen the head tilde 5 before, right? We've, we've seen it with the interactive rebase. So, and that meant five commits back. So basically what you're saying here is I want to check out the point I was at five commits back. Then what you could do is make some changes there, just like with the, the rebase, and commit them. Um, and then when you check out your head, which is, well, in this case, git checkout dash, 
Uh, git checkout dash is a pretty handy command if you don't know it because it, it checks out whichever place you were, you were at before. So if you were just at your head, it will take you back to your head. If we were to run this again now, we would go back five commits again. So, and this also counts for branches or whatever. Um, so it just takes you back to wherever you were before you did your previous checkout. Anywho, um, you've just committed, now you're back at your head. If you now git log, you'll notice that the commit is not there, even though you've just committed it. Now why is that? Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll go over this again. Um, just a different, or okay, wait. Um, we'll do that after, but I just wanna quickly explain to you why you don't see the commit. Um, so has any, does this look familiar to anyone? And has that confused the absolute shit out of you before? Because <laughs> a lot of people, it, it confuses a lot of people. They don't know how to escape it. They don't know what it is. So uh, it confused me for a very long time. But with, like with most things in your CLI, if you just actually read the output, which you don't, <laughs> um, it, it actually kind of makes sense. Um, so what it says is you're in a detached head state. That so far doesn't really make a lot of sense because wh what does that mean? Uh, you can look around, make experimental changes and commit them and you can discard any commits you make in the state without impacting any branches by performing another checkout. Which means that you know it's basically a virtual state. It says detached head state. What your head is, is the point in time that you are at now. So the end of your branch, essentially. If you're going back in time, your head then changes because you're pretending that the end of your branch is there. So it's not really your head, but it is a head state. So that's why it's called a detached head state. I think virtual head state would be a little bit more clear, but it's essentially a virtual head state, uh, state and you can, uh, you can make changes in there, and you can do stuff without worrying that you'll accidentally actually change the history of your branch. So with the git rebase, for instance, and amend, you are very explicitly saying, I want to rewrite my history. When you go back in time, which you sometimes accidentally do, and you, you often forget that you're there, um, you, you may very easily rewrite your history. So this is to prevent you from doing that. If you do want to keep that state, if you do want to keep that commit, you can just check out a fresh branch with the dash B option. So git checkout dash B checks out a, a new branch with a name that you give it. And then it will just copy over the exact state of that virtual, virtual head state onto a new branch and then you have it stored. So let's do that again. This time we're gonna travel back in time again, but we're not gonna use the head tilde whatever. We're gonna um, use a specific uh, commit ID. So there's a commit hash, which is a very long one which is uh, generated from your, from your delta, from your changes. And there's the commit ID here, so that's the shorter one. Uh, you can also use the commit hash, by the way. Uh, but yeah, you can use either. Uh, and you'll end up in the, the same state. So this time, you can make some changes if you're following along, which the only person with a laptop is not doing. So, <laughs> so nobody is following along. But if you were to be following along, uh, you can now make some changes again, commit them, and uh, check out a new branch, and then if you press git log, or if you press git log, as if it's one big button, if you type or run git log, uh, you'll actually still see the commit you just made. So that's time traveling through your history, your commit history. But there is also another type of history in git. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Feel free to shout out. What? Ref log, yes, correct. And ref log is not a history of your commits, is it's a history of all the actions you've taken recently. It's also not a permanent history like your commit is. Well, commit uh, commit history is semi-permanent, of course, because you can rewrite it, but um, but but this ref log has a limited number of entries. So, and obviously you don't really want to go thousands of actions back because you probably don't even remember what you did. Um, but this is a history of all your local actions. Um, including all of your mistakes. <laughs> so you'll see, for instance, in this ref log, you'll see on the, well, let's see, on the fifth line, you'll see it says, and this is um, why ref log, I think, isn't used by a lot of people. It's because it's quite a lot to parse if you 
have never looked at it before, but if you look at the fifth line, it'll, it'll say head 19 or head 20. Um, it'll say rebase, so that's the action you took, dash I, interactive rebase, and then it says finish. So that's when you finished a rebase. And then you'll see uh, before that, there it, or um, like the line after that says rebase interactive start. So that's where you started the rebase. So if you read it like that, you can see what, what happened. Um, so basically, if uh, you can see where you made a mistake. So a lot of people are very scared to do certain things and get like solve merge conflicts or perform a rebase or perform a reset, hard reset, dare I say. Very scary because it all feels very permanent, right? So all of your actions, all of your mistakes can be found in your ref log. Now let's say you made a mistake, like you accidentally dropped something. Okay, so if you're following along, which you're not, um, you could be doing this. So you go into your interactive rebase, but, but do try it out whenever you feel like you can do it in any repo and I promise you it will be okay because it's not as permanent as you might think. So um, you would go into your interactive rebase and you go uh, a few commits back and then you just drop any commit. Uh, you continue your, so you go get rebase dash dash continue uh, and then you get out of your rebase. Then you've dropped a commit. You won't see it when you go get log. Um, but then when you do get ref log, you'll see the point at which you started your re rebase. And then what you need to do is you need to find the line after that, the line below that. And that is the action you had before you started the rebase. So that's the state you want to go back to. You want to go back to the state you were at before you started your rebase and, and drop that commit. So just like with your commit history, you can go back in time in your ref log history. So in the same exact way, your ref log also has a little ID and you can go get checkout, blah, blah, blah. And guess what? You'll be in that detached head state. So if you want to keep that state, you just get checkout dash B again and you have a new branch, fresh branch. Um, but then of course you wanted that on your original branch. So what you can then do is you check out your original branch again and reset it hard to the new branch. That dash before hard, by the way, the font smushes two dashes together, but that's actually two dashes. That's not one long dash, okay? So get reset set dash dash hard. Um, if you're, there, there's some confusion sometimes about reset and what it does exactly. So, um, so basically a hard reset will, will just completely go back to a set or go back or overwrite your current state with the state that you give it. So in this case, you say, I'm going to completely overwrite this branch with this new fixed it branch as if that other branch just never happened basically. Um, so that's a hard reset. Um, then a soft reset, which is the default. Uh, so if you just say get reset without any options, it'll say it'll, it'll do a soft reset. Um, a soft reset will, for instance, if you soft reset a commit, uh, it will undo the commit, but it won't undo the changes. It will just uh, go back to when those changes were unstaged. So it will remove the commit, but it won't uh, remove your unstaged changes. So as opposed to when you reset a commit hard, it will remove the commit and the changes as if the changes never happened, okay? So that's what we're doing here. There is also a much easier way of doing this. Um, can anyone think of how to do this in shorter steps? No? Okay, it actually took me a while um, because I, I kept doing it like this and then I realized there's actually a way easier way to do this. Do you see that get reset dash dash hard with the new branch? Instead of traveling back in time and to the correct step and creating a new branch, blah, 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 what you can also do is just find the correct uh, ID, reference ID, so the ref ID, that thing. I say reference, it's an assumption on my part that ref stands for reference, but I assume it's reference. Anyway, um, you find the correct ref ID and instead of traveling in time, you just reset hard to that point and then you just go back. You, that's all the other steps done, basically. Okay, 
So um, the next thing that I want to talk to you about is bisect. Who here knows about bisect? Couple of hands. Do you know exactly what it does or have you heard about it? Because that's, a, yeah, it's a few thumbs up. But um, yeah, bisect is one of those things that like um, you'll hear about like at conferences in the hallway track, for instance, you'll hear two people talk about it and then one of them is like, oh yeah, bisect, there's nothing like bisect, it's so good. But, and then you're just like, yeah, yeah, man. And then you don't actually know what it is. So that's, that's bisect. <laughs> but it is in fact pretty powerful. Um, so just to explain to you what it does, uh, this is also in the Get Legit talk, so this is a bit of a recap, but we're gonna look at it uh, a little closer. Um, so bisect, you can explain bisect using an egg or a bunch of eggs and a building. So <laughs> you, you really can. This is actually a, like a kind of a, a standard maths riddle, apparently. Um, so let's say someone t gave you a bunch of eggs and pointed at a building and said, I want you to find the first floor of this building that you can drop an egg off of and uh, it will break. So realistically, of course, ground floor, but let's say that's not the case. Um, one approach would be to start on the ground floor and you'll see, oh wow, it doesn't break. I'm gonna go to the next floor, drop again, um, doesn't break, and then you just keep going until at some point you found the floor um, at which it does break. So that works, but of course, if you have a lot of floors uh, and some very sturdy eggs, you like let's say you have 50 floors, you, it might not even break at the 49th floor, let's say, and then you've gone up all those flights of stairs and dropped an egg and went downstairs and picked it up. Um, and uh, yeah, so that can take a really long time. So another approach would be to start in the middle where it might break, and then you know that somewhere between there and the ground floor is the first place that it will break. So and then you'll go in, you go to the middle of that, and then you'll see that it doesn't break. So then you know that the first point it will break is between there and there. And then you'll finally, uh, after a lot fewer iterations, uh, at least that's likely, um, you'll find the, the first floor. So of course you can do this with uh, eggs and a building, but you can also do this with your commit history. So let's say um, you have some unexpected behavior or anything else really, it doesn't e it even need to be unexpected behavior. Um, but let's say you have some unexpected behavior. Let's say you have a website. I'm gonna talk front end here because it's just kind of an easier use case to illustrate. You have a website and there was a button that used to be here and that's where it's meant to be. And then a few months down the line, something somewhere changed and you look at the page and suddenly it's here. And you're like, why did this happen? Where did this happen? So you could be, you could go back to the point in time where you knew it was still okay and then check out manually, check out every commit from there uh, to see what commit changed it. You can also look at your, look through your history and try to see um, if commit messages tell you anything, but let me tell you that's, um, uh, wait, now <laughs> I got the, the 15 minute timer and it completely threw me off. Um, let me tell you, looking through the commit messages doesn't actually, I've done that before and then gone like, oh yeah, this is what must have changed it and then gone back and then that wasn't the problem at all. So what you could do is use bisect instead. Um, so. Let's take the example from before. Let's say that you um, have your repository and you start your bisect and you know that the point in time that it was still good was this commit. So you mark that as good and then you mark the head bad. Then it goes to the middle and then you check the page and see if it's good or bad. And then you go get bisect good if it was bad, get bisect bad if, if the button was here. So get bisect good if the button was here, get bisect bad if the button was here. And then it'll keep doing that. And then you keep refreshing the page on every checkout. You mark it. And then after only a few iterations, it's done. And then to get out of your bisect, you have to go get bisect reset. And then it takes you out of the bisect. But you'll see that they're in the 
kind of in the middle of the screen. I hope it's not too small for everyone. Can everyone see it a little bit okay? I'm sure it's too small for some of you. I'm, I'm really sorry about that. Um, I should probably change that. Um, but yeah, you'll see kind of in the middle, it says blah, blah, blah is the first bad commit and it will give you a commit hash. So, and it will give you the a commit message as well. So then you could, that way you can really find really quickly a point in time where something changed. Now you might think, can we automate that? And the answer is yes, of course. And as someone in, on MTV Cribs may have said, that is where the magic happens. I don't know if you had MTV Cribs. I guess you have. <laughs> so let's say uh, there's, there used to be a file. You know it used to exist, uh, but now it doesn't anymore. Um, so outside of your repo, that's important for reasons I'll explain in a second. Outside of your repo, uh, you create a little script that tests for the existence of uh, uh, this file, like here you'll see the, the path to the file, and then if it does exist, you, it, it does exist, you'll say yes, and exit with exit code zero, which is success, and uh, exit with nope, which is non-zero, uh, which is fail. Uh, and you can just feed that to bisect. It'll, you'll just start exactly the same way, get bisect start, and then you mark a good and a bad point. If I said good, blah, 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 get bisect bad, head. And then it'll check out the middle, but instead of marking it manually now, you can go get bisect run and give it your little scripty script. And then based on the exit code, the failure or success exit code, it will mark it good or bad for you. So um, that of course is even faster. But can you think of any type of scripts that we use on a daily basis that also has have these exit codes. Tests. So that might seem obvious when you hear it, but a lot of people don't really, uh, uh, can't really think of it when I ask that question. But tests work in the exact same way. Uh, a failure or, uh, or a pass is also based on the exit code. So you can do this if, for instance, you don't have amazing, uh, uh, an amazing CI CD pipeline and you, uh, for instance, allow some tests to be read, um, then you might uh, perpetually have some tests that used to be green when they were written, but they failed some point uh, down the line, and you don't know where. So you can, you can feed a bisect a test as well, and it's exactly the same thing, of course. You start your bisect, let's call this the power of repetition. Uh, give bisect start, give bisect bad, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I, I apparently started with bad this time, so that's also an option. But then you give it the tests instead. Um, and then it will just run your test, and then you can find out really easily when a test started breaking. You can go to that commit, see what changed, um, and yeah, find out what broke really, really quickly. Um, this is, if, if you have to think about that, that script before, when I said you have to place it outside of your repo, um, think about why that is. It's, it's because that you just wrote that script, right? And with bisect, you're gonna check out points in the past. So if you put it in your repo, then in the past, that test didn't exist anymore. So you have to put it outside of your repo for it to, uh, to, to run. Okay, so with this approach, with the, um, the auto bisect, and this is why I put the red thing around it, but apparently I also put it at the beginning. Um, this is really important, of course, because if your build fails for some other reason, then uh, you know the, the bisect is going to um, uh, mark it bad. And I think newer versions of Git actually say like, oh, there's um, good and also bad. I don't know how it does that, but it can somehow detect that it's bad because a build broke or something. I don't know. But anyway, it makes, makes it a lot less reliable, of course, when it starts marking things bad that, by your definition, aren't bad. And that, as one person in MTV Cribs has said, is where no magic happens. So again, very important that everything works. Now, last question. Is that 10? OK, good, thanks. <laughs> um, so question. Um, what do you do when a bug is reported? Generally, 
right? The bug is reported, hopefully, to your PO or PM. Then you like try to reproduce it. Then you go and when you've confirmed that, you go and dig into the code. And you know you try to find the issue and the cause of the bug for hours and hours and hours, sometimes days. Then you finally, through blood, sweat, and tears, you've you found what caused the problem. Then you still have to fix it. And then if you're a good little developer, you also write a regression test to make sure that it doesn't happen again. If you use TDD, you might even start with the regression test and then fix it and then create a PR and then you've done your bug fix. Well, what if I told you that um, you could also get the bug report, write the regression test, and then that regression test finds the problem for you and you fix it immediately. So this is where you can follow along. It's actually, I think it's a bit too fast to follow along, but if you want, you can go to that uh, bisector regression testing repo that's on my GitHub thing. Um, and uh, well, here it is again, if you want to save it for later, you can kind of try it out yourself. There's also an article on my website that goes through the exact same steps that we're going to do now, so you can try it out yourself later. Um, and you have to go on that branch, uh, get check out Trogdor, and uh, you have to run Composer install. Again, PHP 7.4 uh, or higher. And then you can run this script. I'll just show you what it is now. It's even smaller, I'm so sorry. Is it okay? Okay, you'll see here that the last commit is let it burn. And then we run this. It says commencing burnination. And it says, ah, my cottage is burning. Burnation completed. So it has some, some output. So basically this script is, uh, Trogdor is a reference to a cartoon dragon from old internet. Um, it's from a website called homestarrunner.com, if you know it. Uh, it's ages ago, but so. Um, so basically Trogdor is a dragon and there is a village with uh, um, a number of cottages and uh, the dragon commences burnination, burninates the cottages, and then the script ends. Now, if you were to then check out the branch Trogdor test, which is, I'll just explain, Trogdor test is just a separate branch for, uh, for the exercise if you want to do it basically, but you know, on a practical level in real life, it would be the same branch, but in the future. So there would be a bunch of new commits. So we're gonna check that out. Um, and then we're gonna see what the newer commits are. So we'll see here that that commit that we know works, right? Is let it burn. And then there's a bunch of other commits that have happened since. And if we run the script now, there's no output. So something's broken. Um, so if we want to uh, see why that is, we can just create a really simple test um, that is already on that branch as well, so you don't have to write it yourself. Um, that just checks for the burnination completed output register. It's not the most robust test, but it's a test, um, just for the, the sake of illustration. Um, yeah, so you know that this test will fail now, right? So this test will fail because there is no output. Fail, okay, we know this. Now what we can do is go into our interactive rebase. Remember we had that script that was outside of the repo before? What we can also do is if we cut the line for the test commit and move it all the way to the back in our history, where we know it will pass. See, now test is there by the let it burn commit. We can even go back in time and check that, yes, it does indeed pass at that point in time. And then we go, go back to our head. And now, of course, because we've moved it back in time, it will exist when we go back in time. So we can run our bisect. So we go get bisect start, mark that commit that we know it passes because we were just there as good, and then the head is bad. And then we just run the test. So git bisect run, and then run the regression test that we've just created, and it will show you exactly where this uncovered behavior, because it's a bug in production, right? So somehow it was in production without it being covered. 
And now we've written the regression test, found the commit that breaks it, getting out of the commit now, and now we can instantly go to that commit and see what the issue is. Is that including or excluding questions? Including, okay. We'll just go really quickly. <laughs> um, okay, so we know that that commit is the one that broke it. So with git diff, we can see what changed between those two commits. If we give that the first commit and the next commit. So we can see what the breaking changes were. Dash w gives you the context of the changes. So it gives you more than just the changes itself. So you can see the surrounding code. And you'll see here that we were checking for Dragon Man before, uh, but now Trogdor is just Trogdor. He's no longer a Dragon Man. So, you know, he doesn't burninate if he's not a Dragon Man. That's the issue, which he's not. So now we're going to go back to the commit that broke. We're going to fix the bug straight away. And I'm just going to skip through that because you know what the bug is. <laughs> Um, but if we fix that bug there, then we're in that detached head state, right? So we can check out a fresh branch. Wolf. The typos don't make this go any faster. <laughs> so we'll see there my fix commit and the test commit. And what we can do with those two commits is uh, squash them. So we go interactive rebase. Squashing a commits, uh, squashing commits takes two commits and smushes them together uh, to create one commit, basically. So if you do that with these, with the test and the fix, you have one commit that fixes the bug and creates a regression test. And then you can create your PR. Uh, you know, you saved yourself lots of time uh, debugging, uh, and you're done. So that's the power of bisect. And I think we still have some time for questions. Yay. <laughs> so does anyone have questions? Well, <laughs> oh, there's one question there. Go ahead. Um, at first, I just wanted to say thank you for this kind of introduction to Bisect. That is probably the best introduction to Bisect I've ever seen. Thank you. <laughs> I think a real life example like that, which is not like totally real, but almost is much better than what we can usually see. And second, I would like to know if you know how to deal with performance issues when running Bisect by running another script. For example, uh, if you have to go like, 50, 50 commits behind, sometimes you have to reset the database or stuff, and how how can you deal with that? Do you have to re-execute re everything every time? Yes. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, yes. Uh, to make it a little bit easier, you could put that all in a script. I mean, I know that's not super easy, but if you create like a bash script that does the build and blah, blah, blah. But to be to be honest, if you have to go that far back, the chances of it being super useful with the amount of time that you have to go in with like all that build stuff um, is questionable, but there there is a way to do it. But unfortunately, you do have to rebuild. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's done now. Um, if you want to uh, to give some feedback, uh, you have to uh, to go to the join in uh, um, page, and you have also the feedback uh, sheets uh, outside. Um, and Voila. <laughs> um, this is for you if you want it, because this was for the, the best question. <laughs> Which honestly was a very good question. So here's a diversity PHP elephant. <laughs>